straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. Alex Jones is back in court. Unless you stop a bully, a bully will never stop himself. They've transformed the hearing and damages. They've transformed money into a political weapon in this trial. And we're going to ask him to disarm them. Opening statements are presented in the InfoWars host's second defamation trial, plus the Pike County Massacre. We walked to the mailbox. I think my brother was dead. Testimony begins as George Wagner IV faces the possibility of the death penalty. And the man convicted in the 2018 beating death of baby Joe Clyde now says he deserves a new trial. And later, I know I have never seen so much alcohol consumed by a pregnant woman. A closer look at the Parkland School shooter's childhood. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Brian Buckmeyer. The second trial in as many months begins for conspiracy theorist and right-wing radio host Alex Jones for his comments about the Sandy Hook school shooting. Law and Crime Network brought you the gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Jones's Texas trial, where a jury ordered him to pay $4.3 million in damages to the parents of Jesse Lewis, a student who was shot and killed in 2012. Jones now faces trial in Connecticut as 15 plaintiffs filed a total of three lawsuits against him after he claimed that the school shooting was a hoax put on by crisis actors. The plaintiffs made up of family members of the students killed and an FBI agent say Jones's followers have harassed him and even made death threats. Jones has already been found liable for the damages in this case, meaning jurors will now decide how much Jones should pay. The trial is expected to last for about four weeks as a six-person jury hears evidence from both sides. On Tuesday, opening statements were presented. The plaintiff attorney showed jurors examples of Jones mocking the Sandy Hook families. He says, but my heart does go out to the people I see on the news who say they're parents. The problem is I've seen soap opera. And I know when I'm watching a movie, and I know when I'm watching something real. And he looks at the camera and he goes, let's look into Sandy Hook. And you're going to hear evidence that that is a call to action. Let's investigate it. Let's look into these parents. Let's expose them for the frauds that they are. Keeps going. 2017, Sandy Hook vampires exposed. Now we're going to present you with dozens of exhibits, but the reality is, of videos and articles, nobody knows how many times they publish this stuff. For Jones's defense, attorney Norman Pattis argued the plaintiffs are using money as a weapon in this case, as a way to stop Alex Jones. They've suggested your job is to punish Alex Jones, and you won't hear that from the judge. They hate him because he says outrageous things. And the haters want to silence. Each of you has chosen to be here today to compensate them for their grief, and you're being asked to make an, a, a, an example of Alex. Money is their weapon of choice. A word enough, and you might summon, or you might silence Alex Jones. He was mocked. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. The plaintiffs and their counsel hope they're here, and it's you. That with money, you'll do what no one else, you'll, you'll do what most of us do at home when we hear something. We don't like We turn off the TV set. Joining us today is legal analyst Dr. Tracy Pearson and co-host Terry Austin. Dr. Pearson, similar to the last trial, this is just a question of how much Jones pays, not if he's liable. So do you expect a different result in this case than the one in Texas? The short answer to your question, Brian, is no. I don't expect a different answer uh, to this to this issue. Uh, we uh, saw this morning that there was a devastating uh, decision made by the judge, at least devastating to Alex Jones, where the court ruled that he could introduce no evidence as a sanction, no evidence that he wasn't uh, making money for or making profit for uh, uh, the type of, of uh, lies that he was spreading because of a, his failure to comply with uh, the court's orders regarding discovery. Um, additionally, there are 15 plaintiffs here, and that means typically that where there are more plaintiffs, there's going to be larger dollars.
Yeah, some bad news for Jones is the last case was just one plaintiff and it was 49.3 million now. It could be a lot more. Terry, Jones's team says an appeal is likely coming in the Texas case. And if he loses in Connecticut, I would assume the same here. So do you see any issues that he may win on on appeal? Well, you know, he has the right to appeal, obviously, and I assume he is going to appeal both in Texas and Connecticut. But he's not going to be able to claim ineffective counsel. For instance, in Texas, when defense counsel accidentally sent those texts to plaintiff's counsel, he can't claim that because that can only be asserted in a criminal case. He also cannot claim that he was not constitutionally given his rights under the Sixth Amendment because that doesn't apply in a civil case either. So he's going to have to argue legal arguments, evidentiary arguments, and essentially in both cases he's going to have to say it was an error when the judge did a motion and allowed the plaintiffs to prevail just based on the fact that he defaulted on court orders. I don't think he's going to win under those grounds. I think that there is sufficient evidence based on the pleadings that the plaintiff did, and I think the verdict that was granted was just. Absolutely. We'll see how this case continues as it progresses. Moving now to Michigan, where the trial is delayed for the parents of the Oxford High School shooter. Jennifer and James Crumbly were set to go to trial next month on charges of involuntary manslaughter. The trial has been delayed, but no new date has been set. Prosecutors say the couple should have done more to prevent the November 2021 shooting, arguing they exposed their son to a chaotic home life and gave him access to the murder weapon. Four students were killed and several others injured when officials say a then 15-year-old gunman opened fire at Oxford High School. Despite his age, the suspected shooter is being held in an adult jail as he awaits trial. Meanwhile, Jennifer and James Crumbly argue their charges should be dropped, alleging they could not have known what their son was planning. The couple is due back in court on October 18th for a Daubert hearing where the judge will review expert witness testimony. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, Joseph Daniels appeals his conviction and fights for a new trial over the 2018 death of his son, Baby Joe. But first, testimony begins in Pike County, Ohio, as George Wagner IV stands trial on eight counts of murder. Welcome back. Witnesses who found the bodies of the eight members of the Rodin and Gilly families took the stand in the Pike County Massacre trial. Law and Crime's Angela Levy tells us what they were told. Bobby Jo Manley is the younger sister to Dana Roden, and she called 911 that morning back in April of 2016. In the state of Ohio, witnesses in trials can opt to not be recorded, and Bobby Jo Manley took that option. We walked to the mailbox. I think my brother was dead. Bobby Jo Manley was frantic as she called 911, but on the stand, she was stoic yet vulnerable. She recalled thinking something was off when she arrived at Chris Roden Sr.'s trailer on April 22, 2016. She said the inside dogs were on the porch and the door was locked. Her friend Billy Morgan got the key from above the door frame and unlocked the door. Once inside, they saw large drag marks of blood going back to the bedroom. That's where they found Chris Sr. and Gary Roden's bodies under a comforter. There's blood all over the house. Okay. My brother walked in the bedroom and looked like I beat the hell out of him. Okay. There's blood all over the front room. Manley went next door to Frankie Roden's trailer to tell him his father was dead. Manley said she found Frankie Roden and his fiance, Hannah Hazel Gilly, in the bed. Hannah Hazel's breast was exposed from breastfeeding. And their six month old son, Ruger, was on his hands and knees in between his parents, covered in blood. The Rodens consoled each other as the jury looked at gruesome crime scene photos. Dana Roden's brother, James Manley, testified that he went into her home and heard Hannah Roden's newborn daughter crying and found his sister dead in her bed. And when you got to where you thought her head was, what did you do? I felt like a pillow over her head. I started to pick the pillow up and you feel it stuck and I just let me have it went out of the house. So you started lifting up the pillow, but you could feel that it was sticking? Yeah. Or it was stuck? Yeah. Okay. And you said then you ran out of the house or went I out I just of the turned house. around and walked back out. Bobby Joe Manley's friend, Billy Morgan, also testified and didn't want to be on camera. He performed chores at Chris Roden's home for him and said sometimes he smelled marijuana around an outbuilding on the property. 
Morgan also said that there were surveillance cameras mounted in several locations, but in the crime scene photos, those surveillance cameras are gone. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy in Waverly, Ohio. Thanks, Anjanette. Terry, this case has a lot of moving pieces and can be very complicated at first glance. Could that complication and somewhat chaotic environment favor the defense in trying to raise reasonable doubt? No question about it, Brian. The more complicated, the better for the defense. The most complicating part of this case is keeping track of the names and the relationships. I mean, we know already that there are eight victims, four defendants, four different crime scenes, and all of those individuals have people who were involved in terms of finding those individuals who were killed. And so the biggest issue for the prosecution is going to keep everything straight. You want that jury to follow your story. In the case of the you know, prosecution trying to pursue the claims against George, it's going to be difficult to establish that motive. We know Jake had the motive because he was fighting for custody. But here, the prosecution is definitely going to have to establish some forensic evidence. They're going to have to say, look, his DNA, he bought the gun, he bought the ammunition. They're going to have to tie that circumstantial evidence or some video into the crime for him. I think that might be a little bit difficult. They have evidence against, you know, obviously Jake, against Angela, but I think it might be difficult. And all you have to do, as you know, is have one juror who doesn't have, you know, in their mind, who has reasonable doubt and doesn't want to convict. And there you have it. So we'll see what happens, but I think there could be some doubt in the case against George here. Yeah, I can see it as well. Dr. Pearson, I'd love to ask you about the witness's testimony today, but so many have opted out of being televised. What are your thoughts on the public's limited viewing of this trial? Well, Anjanette Levy has been critical in this case to our understanding of what's happening because we can't see these witnesses. We can't hear them, uh, most of them. And so uh, she is really our eyes and ears in the courtroom. When it comes to ensuring the integrity of the courts and the public faith in the courts, it's essential that the press be able to broadcast these proceedings and any proceeding in a courtroom. Uh, we've had a, a lot of political unrest in this country, if you will, uh, where people have attacked our, our systems of justice, uh, and it's essential for us to be able to see these things uh, with our own eyes. Absolutely, and I agree with that. Make sure you follow Angela Levy's Twitter as well as Law & Crime, because that's the only place you're gonna get that gavel to gavel coverage of this case. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, a Florida jury could soon decide whether the Parkland school shooter is sentenced to life in prison or the death penalty. Plus, the man convicted of Baby Joe Clyde's murder says he deserves a new trial. Could his motion be granted? Welcome back. Joseph Daniels, a man found guilty in the murder of his son, Joy Cl Joe Clyde Daniels, appeals his conviction as he argues for a new trial. It's been more than a year since a jury returned a guilty verdict against Joseph as he faced a first-degree murder charge in the beating death of his five-year-old son, Baby Joe. Joe Clyde was initially reported missing in April 2018. He was presumed dead just days later, and his body has never been found. Joseph confessed to the beating uh, a beating of Joe and hiding his body, Joe Clyde's mother, Crystal Daniels, admitted to being present when their son died. She was set to go to trial earlier this year, but instead pled no contest to child abuse charges and will serve 15 years in jail. Joseph was sentenced to life in prison last fall, but his attorneys now argue there was insufficient evidence. They say his confession was coerced and that the jury never should have been allowed to hear the video in which Joseph says, quote, why did I kill my son? Also at issue was the lack of DNA or any other physical evidence to prove Joe Clyde was dead after he disappeared. The motion will likely end up at the State Court of Appeals if Daniel's request for a new trial is denied. Terry, the defense is arguing there was insufficient evidence to convict. Where do you think the prosecution best fought that argument? Well, you know, it's a good argument, but obviously the jury disagreed with that. They thought there was plenty of evidence to convict. And even though it was circumstantial, they know for a fact because the mother actually said she was present when all of this was happening. She admitted to it. And so she actually saw baby Joe die. They're also trying to claim that that confession was coerced. Not likely, Brian, because 
basically it was a normal confession. He was given Miranda rights. It wasn't extremely lengthy. And the judge admitted parts of that video because clearly they established a foundation and they showed that the evidence was really introduced correctly. So there is no legal grounds there. So I don't think that he's going to be able to argue anything as far as an appeal is concerned. He's saying they lacked DNA and physical evidence. That's probably the best evidence that they're going to have against, you know, saying that this was insufficient. So I definitely think that, uh, you know, the appeal at the end of the day is not going to prevail. Yeah, we'll see how that continues. Dr. Pearson, with what we've heard so far, where do you think the judge is leaning, uphold the conviction or reverse? Well, you know, I try not to predict because things can go wonky very easily, but there is an unreasonably high burden for a new trial in Tennessee. Uh, you have to show that there's no material evidence to support the verdict. Um, the, taking the strongest reasonable view of the evidence in favor of the verdict uh, inferences must be drawn in favor of the verdict, and you have to dispose of any contrary evidence. So he's got a really steep hill to climb. And so I, I, I while I'm not predicting, I think it's probably unlikely he's going to get a new trial. I don't know. I feel like I got a tiny prediction out of you there, doctor, <laughs> but we'll see how it continues. I tend to agree. It's going to be an uphill battle for Joseph Daniels in this case. When we come back, we head to Florida for the Parkland School Shooter Penalty Phase Trial. What witnesses the defense calls on day 23 of the trial? Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily. The jury hears from a fetal alcohol syndrome expert as testimony continues for the 11th day of the defense's case in the Parkland shooter penalty phase trial. On February 14, 2018, a then 19-year-old gunman opened fire at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. 17 people were killed and 17 more injured in October of last year. The gunman pled guilty to all charges. It's now up to a Broward County jury to determine whether the defendant will receive life in prison or the death penalty. For its case so far, the defense has narrowed in on the defendant's troubled childhood, pointing the finger at both his biological and adoptive mothers. Multiple witnesses have testified that the defendant's biological mother knowingly used drugs and alcohol while pregnant with him. On Tuesday, a fetal alcohol syndrome expert testified that he had never seen so much alcohol consumed by a pregnant woman. Nick's mother um, had really very poor prenatal care, and we know prenatal care is absolutely critical for, um, for a child. At um, the second prenatal visit, which was at 28 weeks, um, her, her weight, the mother's weight, had decreased over that period of time. So as opposed to gaining weight during the entire second trimester of her pregnancy, she actually lost weight. And the size of the fetus, based on a fund, what they call a fundal height, uh, had uh, um, not grown uh, through that period of time uh, as well. So um, the whole issue of prenatal care, I think, is, is critical. And the fact that she um, actually lost weight, I think, is critical uh, as well, uh, based on his health in, in utero. Um, so her nutritional status was horrible, and I suspect that it was and this is obviously speculation on my part, but I think it's uh, quite likely uh, related to the alcohol exposure that she had uh, during that part of her pregnancy. Dr. Pearson, if the jury was to decide life in prison, what evidence so far do you think would be the reason for that? I think hearing from that expert gave the jury the opportunity to grab onto something scientific, something real that they could hold on to. I also think that hearing about his troubled childhood where he found his father dead, where uh, he struggled uh, in school and the school didn't implement the right kinds of interventions. We heard from another expert who testified that the right kinds of interventions were not implemented for him to help him catch up developmentally. I also think that there is a piece of evidence that may backfire on the prosecution, and that is the video of uh, Nicholas Cruz uh, speaking into the camera before the shooting, where it supports Melissa McNeil's contention, his defense lawyer's contention that, well, 
His brain was simply just broken. Terry, as I hear the shooter's mitigation, I can see how it affected his acts, but could this evidence against him be beyond mitigation, or is there a chance for life in prison? Well, with human nature, I think there is a chance for life in prison. Again, we just need that one person, and he would get life in prison if that person can't say we will vote for him to be put to death. We heard from multiple witnesses. They're all confirming the same thing, that he was impacted by that fetal alcohol syndrome. We heard Dr. Kenneth Jones testified today that there was more alcohol consumed by his birth mother than anyone else he had ever seen. And we previously heard from Paul Connor, who was a neuropsychologist. He said that people with fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, they demonstrate everything that the defendant demonstrated, meaning he had impulse control issues, he had difficulty socializing. And then essentially we heard from all of the teachers who said that they saw exactly that type of behavior that all of these physicians were saying the defendant really demonstrated. So I think there could very well be one person on that jury who is looking at this as if to say, you know, look, it's not his fault. So we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. We see a lot of people fetal alcohol syndrome, but not a lot of people do the shooting that he did. Well, thank you for joining us here on Law and Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.